Sorting a list works just like an array. As a matter of fact, since the list contains an array internally, really, what's the difference? You call sort without parameters to use the compare to method of the iComparable interface of each element in the list. And if the elements don't implement iComparable, sort called without parameters will fail. You can pass an instance of a class that implements iComparer to override the default sort order or to provide a comparer for classes that don't implement iComparable. You can also pass the address of a comparer delegate instance procedure. In any case, the compare procedure has to return minus 1, 0, or plus 1. Now I know you've seen how to sort an array. Let's investigate how you can use the same technology to sort a generic list. To demonstrate sorting, I'll choose option D, walk into our code, and here I'll start by getting a directory info object that refers to my C colon folder, create a new list of file info objects, and add the range that I get by calling the getFiles method of my directory info object. It's an array. I can just supply that array to the addRange method and stuff it on in. Of course, I could have passed the results of the getFiles method to the constructor of my file list and remove one line of code. For some reason, I feel more comfortable doing it this way. Just me. Let's list out the current list of files. And they are, amazingly enough, already in alphabetical order. That's what Windows does for us. In any case, let's pretend we want to sort them now based on their names. To do that, because file info doesn't implement iComparable, we're going to have to provide our own iComparer class. Here's compare names. It implements iComparer of file info, the generic iComparer interface. Because it implements the generic iComparer, we get a compare procedure already receiving strongly typed parameters. So all this procedure needs to do is return the comparison of the full name property of one file info with the full name property of the other. OK, that seems easy enough. Here we are in our code. We're being called for every file we want to compare. Well, I probably didn't want to single step through this. There's only a few files, though. We'll step out of this sooner or later. At least it proves it's being called, right? Well, it gets called a lot. So I think I'll go back to here and set a breakpoint on the next line of code and just say run full speed to there. There we go. And now we display the files in name order. Well, of course, they were already in name order, so it didn't prove much. OK, now we want to sort based on size. To do that, we can provide a different iComparer here we have our compare sizes class that implements the generic iComparer interface. It receives strongly typed parameters. And again, you've probably seen this code before. We compare the length of one file to the length of another. If they're the same, then we compare the full name property of one file to another and return that result instead. This allows us to sort first by size and within a given size by name. If we let this run, Go back to our code here. Let this run. You'll see we end up with files sorted by size. And there's our results sorted by size first and within a given size by name. But you don't have to create that iComparer class if you don't want to. You can just provide the address of procedures that match the generic delegate type that's required. The generic delegate type requires that you specify a procedure that has two parameters, each of the same type, and it has to be the type that's in the list that you're sorting. You have to return an integer back, and the integer has to be minus 1, 0, or plus 1. You've seen this all before. And these two procedures do the same thing as the compare two procedures in these classes over here. Here, rather than creating a class or an instance of a class, you can just specify the address of a procedure that meets the correct generic delegate type. And you get the same sorting behavior, first on name, then on size, and within size by name. So just as with an array, you have multiple choices for working with a generic list. And those choices are easier if you have classes that implement the generic iComparer interface, or have procedures that satisfy the requirements of the correct generic delegate. 
In order to find items in the list, you can use the index of or last index of methods. These are both linear searches, that is, on the order of n. As you double the size of the list, you double the length of time it takes to find items using these methods. You can use the contains method to determine if an item is in the list, but this too performs a linear search. The binary search method, which is O log n, that's base 2, means that as you increase the size of the list, your search doesn't necessarily slow down very much. It returns the index of the item you're looking for if it was found. It returns the two's complement of the correct index if it's not. This requires a sorted list, and the sorted list must be sorted using the same comparer as you're using for binary search. What this indicates is the binary search method requires some sort of way to compare items, and the comparer you use for binary search has to be the same comparer you use to sort, or the binary search method will return invalid results. All these methods require some way to tell if two items in the list are equal, and so the items have to implement the iEquatable interface in order for us to find an item in the list. I'll choose item E to look for items, and we'll start by again creating a new list of writer. All right, well right now we don't have anything in there, so we better add some things. I'm going to create a variable named Doug to represent a new writer named Doug, because I'll need that variable later, and add Doug to my list of writers. The same for Andy. I'll create a new writer named Andy. The variable is named Andy too, and I'll add Andy to my list. Let me add a few more. Those are distractors, they're called, because we won't be looking for them. Okay, let's display the list, and you'll see we have in our list Doug, Andy, Mary, Ken, Robert, Brian, and Melanie. All right. So now let's attempt to find the index of Doug. Now, to find the index of Doug, the list is going to have to look at each item in turn and see if it equals Doug. And the only way to determine if one item equals another is if you implement I equatable. Luckily, the writer's class does. So the index of returns here position 0. We found him right away. If we had a million items and Doug was at the end of the list, it might have taken a couple seconds to find Doug. Let's try the contains method. This returns true if an item exists within the list. OK, so let's try it. Does Doug exist in the list? Well, let's see if my writers.contains Doug returns true or not. And of course, it does. So let's try a writer that isn't in the list. I'll create a new writer named Peter, and we'll check to see if Peter is contained in the list. So the contains method should return false in this case. And so it does. Let's try a binary search using the default comparer. So here, we'll just use the sort method without any comparer supplied. This uses the iComparable interface of the writer class to perform the sort. And by default, we sort on name. So I'll do a binary search without supplying a comparer for Doug. Of course, Doug is found at index 2 at this point. Yep, there he is, item 2. Because once we sort him, he is at position 2. You can see it there in the list. OK, now let's use a different comparer. So in this case, I'm going to use a new instance of the compare states class. Let's look at that. Compare states implements iComparer of writer, the generic iComparer. So the compare method gets handed to writer instances, and you need to determine how you want to compare writers. I'd like to compare them based on state, so I'll compare the home state property of one to the home state property of the other. All right, so we're first going to need to sort using that comparer, and we'll display the list in sorted order based on state. It appears to be California, 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 Florida, Florida, Illinois, Washington. It's alphabetical based on state. OK, now we'll perform a binary search passing in that same comparer. Remember, if you sort using a comparer, you have to search using the same comparer. So now, if I search for Doug, I'm really searching for IL. That's the field the comparer is using. So was it found? 
it was found at index 5. Is that true? I-L was found at index 5. That's right. Let's search for Andy. Well, of course, we're really searching for F-L, and F-L was found at index 3, and so it was. The point of that exercise, by the way, was to point out that when you're searching for an item that appears more than once in the list, you're not guaranteed which one of them you'll find. We found the first one. Depending on circumstances, we might just as likely have found the second one. So remember, if you're searching for an item and it appears more than once in the list, binary search doesn't guarantee which one it will find. Here, if I search for Jennifer in CO, Colorado is not in our list, so where was it found? Minus 4. And to calculate where in the list that should be, take the negative, that's 4, subtract 1, that's 3, so CO would appear at position 3, and that's exactly right. If Jennifer was in the list, it would appear right here at position 3, which you get by taking the negative of this and subtracting 1. It gives us position 3. The list class provides a set of methods that work in a special way, unlike any other class except the array class, which has very similar functionality. You supply the address of a procedure that meets specific requirements and the method calls that procedure for each element of the list. The result depends on the particular method, but that address is called a predicate. It's simply a callback. The list class calls your procedure for each element. It takes an action on each element. That would be a system.action delegate. Or it determines if each element matches some criteria. That would be the system.predicate delegate or it converts each element. That would be the system.converter delegate. Each of these is a generic delegate, and you specify the address of the procedure, has to have a parameter that matches the type of the item in the list. But in each case, it takes the action for you. So imagine you want to take a list and return a second list containing all the original elements converted to a new type. You could loop through each element, or you could call the list.convertAll method supplying a predicate of the system.converter delegate type. That would just, in one line of code, hand you back a new list filled in with the converted types. Another scenario. What if you want to retrieve a list that contains a subset of values from a list given some criteria? Maybe you have a list of files and you want a sublist that returns all the files that are smaller than a given size. You could loop through all the items, copying matching ones to a new list. Or you could call list.findAll, supplying a predicate of the system.predicate delegate type. This will say yay or nay for each item in the list, and the list.findAll method will only copy the ones where your procedure returns true. What if you want to iterate through all the items of the list, taking an action on each item? What if you don't know the action until runtime? Because really, if you ask the first question, you would just say do a for each loop. Well, you could create a for each loop, making choices inside the loop based on some criteria. Or you could call the list.foreach method, specifying the address of a system.action delegate instance. It'll run that method for each item in the list, doing whatever your method says to do. This whole concept relies on both generics and delegates. The .NET framework types that define the signature of procedures. That's what delegates are. These delegates specify parameters and return values. The system.predicate type accepts a value of the type in the list and returns a Boolean. That's your I say yes, I say no for each item in the list procedure. The list.findAll method uses this delegate type to determine if items meet a criteria or not. The system.converter delegate accepts an input parameter that matches a type in the list and returns a converted value. List.convertAll uses this delegate type. The system.action delegate type accepts an input parameter that matches a type in the list and returns no value. It just 
does some action for each item in the list, and list.foreach uses this. What methods do we have? We have list.convertAll, which uses the system.converter delegate. We have list.exists and list.trueForAll. Exist returns true if any item in the list matches the predicate. TrueForAll returns true if everything in the list matches the condition in your predicate. Find all returns all items in the list that match your predicate. Find or find last returns the first or last item that match your predicate. For each uses the system.action delegate and just takes an action for each item in the list. And remove all removes all items in the list that match the condition in your predicate. Let's look at an example that demonstrates each of these methods and their various predicate types. I'll choose option F to demonstrate working with predicates, and we'll start by filling a list of file info objects as we have in the past. So now we have our list full of files we found in my C colon backslash folder. I'd like to use the find and find index methods to look for files. Now one way to do this is to create an explicit variable, I called it match, which is a new instance of the system.predicate of file info type. We give it in its constructor the address of a procedure that meets the criteria of being a system.predicate delegate of file info. Let's go large is a procedure. It accepts in a file info object, which means it takes the right type in. It returns a Boolean back, and that makes it match the system.predicate of whatever type generic delegate. We have another one, is small. Is small returns true if the file's length is less than 500. Is large returns true if the file's length is greater than 10,000. Okay, so we come in now and we create that variable match, which will refer to the is large procedure. Okay, so let's call file list.find, the find method passing in this delegate instance which refers to a procedure which meets all the criteria we need to be able to say yes or no for each file we come to. So we'll keep looking through files, that's what find does, till it finds a file that causes the isLarge method to return true. We get that right away, and we can even find the first large files index by calling the find index method. One line of code, just the list.findIndex method passing in the delegate instance pointing to the procedure that's doing the comparisons, and we end up with... Okay, now for finding the first small file, I'll call the find method again, but this time rather than creating an explicit delegate instance, I'm just going to pass the address of the procedure I want to call. Now remember, if the isSmall procedure didn't meet the requirements, of the file list generic list instance, the code wouldn't compile. If I try to accept a string rather than a file info object, this code wouldn't compile. That's the beauty of all this. You know at compile time if you have an error. Okay, well here's our is small procedure being called for each item in that list. Let's go back here, because I don't want to watch that happen. There we are, and we found it right away. All right, so let's try another one, find all. The find all method returns all of the items in the original list for which this procedure returns true. Remember, find all method will call that procedure for every item in the list. It returns back a list of the same type as the original list, and we'll call that small files. We get the list and we display it, and here is a list of all the small files from the original list. We can do the same thing for the large files. I pass address of is large, and I get handed back a list of just the large files. One line of code, you get your list of large files. And there they are. Okay, let's try true for all. Let's get 
true if all the files in the list are small. What will happen is the true for all method will call this procedure for every item in the list. As soon as it finds one for which this procedure returns false, it stops and it returns false. If they all return true, the method returns true. And of course, they're not all small, so the method returns false. Let's test to see if any file is small. It does that by calling the exists method. Passing in the address of is small, it will call that procedure for each item in the list. As soon as it finds one for which the method returns true, it stops and it returns true. If it gets all the way to the end and none of them have returned true, it returns false. So you can see there is a file that is small. We can see true in the output window here. Let's try another example. Let's try the remove all method. Remove all allows you to pass the address of a procedure. It will call for each item in the list. And if any item in the list returns true when it calls is large, that item will be removed from the list. So we're effectively removing all the large files in one line of code. We see now there's our list with all the large files removed from it. OK, let's try a different kind of predicate. These are system.action predicates. Well, the display in console window method looks a little different. This is a sub. It still takes in a file info, so it matches the correct generic delegate type, and it takes some action, displays in the console window. Display in output window is also a sub that takes in a file info, so it matches the correct generic delegate type. It writes to the debug window. Let's come back and run our code. We call for each once with each different predicate, and we'll see output in the console window, and we'll see output if we view output window here. There's the results in the output window. Now, normally, you wouldn't call the for each method just to avoid writing a for each loop. There's really no difference. The only benefit to the for each method is you can pass in the address of the procedure you want, making choices at runtime determining which action you want to take. That's a nice, easy way to avoid having to have lots of complicated if and else and then and all that code in your for each loop. Instead, just pass the address of the procedure that does what you want. The converter predicate's a little more complicated. To use the converter predicate, you have to actually create a variable of the delegate type you want to use. That's because the converter delegate is the only one that uses a type other than the type in the list. It doesn't know what type you're converting to, so it has to know before you use it what exactly you're converting to. So I've created a variable convert to string as a new instance of the converter delegate type. We tell it it's of file info, that's the input type, and string, that's the output type. And we give it the address of the procedure we're going to call. File info to string. Let's go look at it. File info to string is a method that takes in a file info. That's the first item in the two generic types. And it outputs a string. That's the second item. That's how we have to specify it. And this does the work of converting from the input type to the output type. In this case, it's simple. We just return the full name property of the file. OK. That's all it takes. We have our variable that refers to the procedure. That's our delegate instance. And now we're going to call the convert all method. It returns back a list of the output type. And we pass in the address of the procedure we're going to call. See why we had to have a variable? Otherwise, how would the compiler know what this type is supposed to be? In any case, we've got the variable here and we call the convert all method, and we end up with a list of the converted files, converted to strings. At this point, file names contains a list of six strings, not file info objects, but instead, they're strings. We run at full speed, and we'll see that list of strings in the console window.